No, Sam, thank you. This is good. This is what I wanted to figure out. I was trying to figure out if there were technical issues, and uh, you actually did find them. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I assume the sound is working now. Um, so, uh, let me try to start again. Good morning, and welcome to our Linda Road Church family, and anyone who may be visiting with us. I'm John McCarthy, and this is Lesson 6 of A Study of the Life of Joseph, based off the material by Max Licato, called You'll Get Through This. First, let me say Happy Mother's Day to any mothers who are joining us this morning. You make all the difference in the world to your families and through your self-sacrifice and service. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for another morning, another Lord's Day, for a beautiful day outside. Thank you, Lord, that we can meet together in, in our own houses uh, and just to, to encourage one another 
And we're looking forward to worshiping you, Lord, in the next hour together as a family. And I pray that in this hour, we can find strength and encouragement from your word and from the life of Joseph. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. All right, so let's review again what I've been calling a framework for hard times. First of all, you'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. This is what we're going to be talking about this morning. But God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive. But don't despair either. With God's help, you will get through this. So to recap from last week, we talked about considering the possibilities for growth in difficult times. Instead of giving it to self-pity, depression, or despair, we can look to the Lord. Instead of asking, why me? We can ask, what do you want me to learn, Lord? Or, how do you want me to grow? In many ways, last week's lesson spoke to the statement, but don't despair either, from our framework. And again, this is a story right out of the headlines. From this past week, an article from the Washington Post, the coronavirus pandemic is pushing America into a mental health crisis. I'm sure many of you have heard the awful news that suicide rates have skyrocketed recently as well. Well, it's a reminder how much we need each other, how God has wired us as social beings, needing one another to be healthy. It's a reminder, too, of the difficulty that Joseph must have faced in Egypt. Again, he didn't have anyone, but he had God, and so he didn't give in to despair. And let's just get right into it. Today we're talking about how it won't be quick when you're in a tough bind. Boy, again, this feels very timely. Many people are tired of waiting for stay-at-home orders to be lifted, for their businesses to be allowed to open for a return to normal. Here's a headline this week. There's no timetable to reopen from New Jersey coronavirus lockdowns. Quote, whether you like it or not, Governor Murphy says. Seems like this is the big debate in question right now. And it's not just a matter of being impatient over the situation, but it's also a problem with the perpetual just 10 more minutes kind of approach. In March, we were being told, Hey, it's just 15 days. Give us 15 days. Then in April, it was pleased from the Surgeon General's, uh, from the Surgeon General, just one more week for lockdown, please. Now we're in May, and people are getting antsy over not just when the lockdown's to be over, but for a, mo a more concrete schedule for when this time will end. We talked last week about the temptation to ask, why me, when trouble comes? And maybe these days we haven't been asking why, as much as when. When will this end? When will we be able to meet again? Well, I've been reading David McCullough's, bi David McCullough's biography on Harry S. Truman sitting right here by my desk, and another sentiment jumped off the pages at me recently. Truman became president near the end of World War II, and just this past Friday, the world marked the 75th anniversary of VE Day, the end of World War II in Europe. Europe had been at war from the time Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939 until May 8th, 1945. That was five years, eight months, seven days, or 2,076 days. Here's a quote from the book Truman following the end of the Pacific War in August 1945. Quote, fully 12 million men and women were in uniform and hoping to return to normal life as soon as possible. Now here in Idaho, We've been under stay-at-home orders since March 25th. Today is the 47th day of social distancing in Idaho. Europe had been at war for over 2,000 days. And you talk about a long wait. You talk about times of uncertainty. Talk about wanting to get back to normal. In some ways, it really puts it into perspective. But who does like to wait? We don't, and no one does. I don't want to wait in line at the DMV. I don't want to wait in line at Costco just to get in the store. Even when we're waiting these days, most of us are on our phones. It doesn't take me too long to compulsively pull out my phone when I'm waiting in line. As a culture, we've trained ourselves to not, not want to wait. So that brings us to our discussion question this morning. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? I was thinking about asking another you know, just cute, simple discussion question like, what's the longest line you ever waited in? It's probably Disneyland or something like that. But let's just get into it this morning. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. First of all, a couple of ideas uh, or a couple of things from the comments we'll be going over here. Clint shares with us, waiting on the Lord 
I think means realizing his sovereignty and accepting it. Patience, not my speciality. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that. A lot of people saying no one can hear you, but we've got that one resolved. What else do we have in the uh, comments? Oh, Carolyn Helley is also sh saying Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers of the congregation. Miss you all. I agree with that. Absolutely. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to be getting into it this morning uh, again with Joseph. So let's go back to Joseph. When we last left him, he was in another pit. This time it's a dungeon. It's Pharaoh's prison after being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 40 this morning. Now God has continued to give Joseph success in prison, and he's looking out for the welfare of the other prisoners. As we discussed last week, instead of focusing on himself, he has compassion for the other prisoners, and uh, that compassion extended to the cupbearer and the baker when they were in prison and obviously uh, not doing well one morning. He asked them, why, why, are you, uh, why are your faces downcast? Why are you, why are you so sad? Now, he, in, he interprets their dreams and he's giving credit to God for this. In Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, he says that the interpretation of dreams belongs to God, which he'll continue with. He'll do this with Pharaoh as well. Now, let's take a look at his plea for the cupbearer in uh, verses 14 and 15 from Genesis 40. He says, Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and to get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in this pit. Sadly, we remember what happened uh, after this. Well, first of all, the cupbearer was restored to his position, and the baker was hanged, as uh, Joseph, through God, interpreted and predicted. But Joseph is forgotten. Verse 23 of Genesis chapter 40. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Genesis chapter 40, the next verse starts with, after two whole years. Now this is a good reminder for us. It's easy for us to turn the page or start a new chapter in the Bible and overlook how much time is actually passing between events. In some ways, it could start feeling like uh, miracles were happening every other day in the Old Testament, when in reality it was more like once in a generation, if that. Uh, Genesis Let's talk a little bit about the timeline here for Joseph himself. Genesis 37.2 says that Joseph was 17 years old when he had his dreams. He was probably thrown into a pit and sold by his brothers shortly thereafter, so he's about 17. Genesis 41.46 says that Joseph entered Pharaoh's service when he was 30 years old. So by the time Genesis 41 comes around, he's been in Egypt over a decade, spending several years both in Potiphar's house and now at least two years in prison. Probably longer than that because he's already kind of in charge of the other prisoners and doing work in the prison by the time the cupbearer and the baker come along. So now he's stuck in prison. He's forgotten about and time is slipping away or maybe it's just standing still for him. Maybe he's losing track of the days. Maybe it's one day like another. And again, we know that God is going to bring Joseph through this time, but he didn't know that. We'll come back to him in a minute to see how he came through these two long years. Let's talk for a minute for some possibilities about why do we have to wait? Why do we wait on the Lord? First, I think it's important for us to realize that God has a different perspective on time than we do. It's a good reminder to us. This goes all the way back to the first words of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I, I look at that as saying that God created time as part of this creation in the beginning. God exists outside of and yet interacts with his creation in a way that we can't fully understand. But he also gives us some insight. In 2 Peter 3.8, we read that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Again, I think that this alludes to the fact that God exists outside of time, but he also has a different perspective on time. He has a, a different understanding of a span of time. Whereas for us, 20 years might seem like a virtual eternity or a long time. For God, it's nothing. Also, we need to recognize that God knows the right time. Paul makes it very clear in the timing of Jesus coming to earth. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we read, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Paul also makes this point in Galatians 4, 4, when he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. Now, it's a great study to consider how God knew the right time for sending Jesus and his gospel. But I'd like to suggest that God knows the right time for events in our lives as well. Now, there's one other possibility um, that we've been given in the study guide. I'm a bit hesitant to bring it up because I admit I don't fully understand it that well, and I think it causes a lot of speculation. But there might also be conflict that we can't see. This is from Daniel chapter 10, and when we're getting to the prophets here, we need to tread lightly. Uh, I encourage you to read Daniel 10 on your own this week. I'll summarize the chapter. Daniel has been in mourning for three weeks, and he's fasting from eating meat and wine. In verses 10 through 14, he has a vision, and a messenger tells him an incredible story about how he was sent by God on the first day of his three weeks of mourning, but was prevented from reaching Daniel for 21 days because of conflict with the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which seems to be alluding to a spiritual conflict. Now, again, I'm going to urge caution here. It's easy to get caught up in speculating about angels battling spiritual forces of evil, and it's always amazing to me how people are usually pretty certain about all the details uh, in these events. But I don't think we see enough written in the Bible to be certain about it. But we do have uh, verses like Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we know that there is uh, plenty going on there, plenty that we can't entirely even comprehend and know about. But when it comes to waiting on the Lord, God knows the best time, and we have to say there might be a possibility that there's more here than meets the eye. So let's talk for a little bit about how do we wait on the Lord. Well, first of all, we don't despair. This is a call back to last week. Waiting on the Lord means we're not assuming the worst. We're not worrying or we're not fretting. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not. We could just stop there. Fret not. Uh, let's not give in to despair. But he says, fret not over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. You know, it's going to be difficult when we're going through tough times. We're going to start wanting to do these comparisons like to other people like, hey, I know that I'm doing better than this guy, spiritually speaking, but I'm doing worse, you know, physically speaking or in some other way. But we need to continue to have our confidence in God. Now, we might not understand the situation totally, or we might understand it and just want it to be over with. But we need to continue to trust in God that he will see us through this difficult time. Waiting on the Lord also means hoping in his word. Uh, this is uh, just kind of like the, the song that we listened to at the beginning of the lesson, I Will Wait For You. I'm looking forward to uh, learning the song with you all, uh, hopefully in September, by the way. It's been quite an encouragement for me during this time. Um, but as that song says, my hope is in your word, or in his word. This is alluding to Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. God's word is going to be a strength of source for us while we wait. It provides examples of how others have waited, like Joseph, and reminds us of God's promises. Also, while we're waiting, how, how do we wait? Waiting doesn't mean that we do nothing. Now, Joseph didn't just curl up in a corner waiting for God. He was still at work in the prison helping the other prisoners. Nehemiah is also a great example of diligently waiting for the Lord. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. So in Nehemiah chapter 1, let's start uh, just by reading the first three verses here. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who have survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Okay, so Nehemiah has been given some terrible news about Jerusalem. And in verse 4, uh, he says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. 
So we see again, several days are passing here. Uh, Nehemiah records uh, one of his prayers in verses 5 through 11. And what great examples Nehemiah is for us uh, when it comes to prayer. Uh, and, and again, I encourage you to read this prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. We skip down to verse 11. Nehemiah says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Okay, he's cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Uh, and he says, please give me success in front of this man today. But again, as we go to another chapter, let's make an observation about time passing again. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had been sad in his presence. Okay, it's now the month of Nisan. He was given the word about, uh, the, about what was going on in Jerusalem uh, in the month of Chislev. This is actually four months later. Sometime, sometimes today can turn into four months pretty quickly. But we see that Nehemiah is still faithful. He's still faithful in his duties, and he's patiently waiting and working for an opportunity with the king. And it required bold action on his part. And uh, yes, Clint agrees. Nehemiah is a great example of patiently waiting. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to Joseph. One day, two whole years later, Back in Genesis chapter 41 with me. You can just imagine the scene. Joseph is in the prison just like any other day. Maybe he's talking with the other prisoners. Maybe he's taking care of some other task. I imagine he's doing something productive like any other day. Suddenly there's a great commotion. People coming down to fetch him for the king. He's in no condition to stand before Pharaoh in the royal court. He's taken somewhere where he can be cleaned up. He's He's probably shaved since that was in fashion. It's a bit of a rush job, but speak about waiting. On the other side, you don't keep the king waiting. We all agree on that one. Let's take a look at the scene, verses 14 through 16, Genesis 41. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So how can we know that Joseph was waiting on the Lord these past two plus years? Well, when standing before the king of Egypt, a man that doesn't know anything about his God, Joseph makes it clear that it, that it is the Lord that has the ability to interpret dreams and not him. Joseph glorifies God and shows that through these years, he is still has faith in the Lord, and that he still finds God faithful. And in fact, he's going to be speaking to Pharaoh more about God in the following verses. We see that he mentions it again in verse 25, he mentions God to Pharaoh, and in verse 28, and then in verse 32 as well. He makes it very clear that this, is, that this message is from God, and it is not anything about his own interpretation or by his own power. What a great example for us, Joseph is in waiting and in still coming through on the other side, um, hoping in the Lord. Now, before we in class, in class today, we have to go back to Isaiah chapter 40 if we're talking about waiting on the Lord. Richard shared this uh, message with us uh, several weeks uh, ago as well, and it's such a good reminder. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And my right is disregarded before my God. Now, God is, God is providing hope for his people during an awful time for them in captivity. And they're basically saying here, at, at least how Isaiah is hearing it, uh, they're saying, God doesn't care about me. He doesn't listen to me. Now, this is the voice of despair. But Isaiah's response is so encouraging. He says, The Lord, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So Isaiah reminds them about the nature of God. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. 
Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's an interesting idea of, of waiting for the Lord and that being a renewal for our strength. I mean, when's the last time that a wait seemed refreshing? Usually it seems the opposite way. It seems grating. It wears on our patience, we talk about. We don't talk about waiting being an opportunity for God to renew our strength. Hopefully during this time of separation, as we wait for the Lord, we can renew our strength, and we can renew our strength in Him. Well, let me see if there are any more comments here this morning. Okay, yeah, I want to thank you all for the encouragement, the encouraging words in the comments. Um, you, you all have been such a great encouragement to me, just being here, being together. Uh, thank you again for your participation in this class. I hope the class has been an encouragement to you this morning as well. I miss you, and of course, I hope to see you again soon. Again, I, I want to keep reiterating, please reach out to your church family. Um, we're here for you, your brothers and sisters. Call someone if you're struggling, if you're struggling with anything. Um, call, call, call one of the elders. Call again one of your brothers and sisters. Uh, don't struggle alone. We do care for you. God cares for you. We want to pray with you. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting with you all in the next hour for worship. Thank you again for sharing this time with me. Take care.